Hi, everybody. My name is Jordan Ostroff with Legalese Marketing, and this is Exhibit A Attorneys, where we interview attorneys and other experts across the country to talk about what it truly takes to be the Exhibit A of a successful attorney. Uh, today's guest may be the one I'm looking forward to the most. So for those of you that... What? No pressure. Yeah, no, no pressure. So <laughs> Danya Hunt, for those of you that don't know, Danya is a former Olympic athletic therapist and strength and conditioning coach turned multi-passion entrepreneur. Her main focus is slaying the invisible dragons, holding purpose-driven high-performing high performers back from creating the income and impact they know is possible. She focuses on elevating the person behind the business, dialing in on mindset, habits, and business coaching. For those who that know me, habits and mindset, hands down, two of my favorite things. So part of why I'm so excited. She's also certified in neuro-linguistic programming, NLP, a life and success coach, time techniques practitioner, clinical hypnotherapist, and an emotional freedom techniques facilitator, or EFT. Outside of her own one-to-one -one and small group coaching, she's trained by and coaches on James Wedmore's team and performance coaching, plus the co-creator of the Back on Track program with Pure Life Organics. She's spoken on Tribe Live stage in front of over a thousand attendees, uh, not during COVID. Well, one day we'll get back to those sort of things, and has been featured on multiple podcasts Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire, et cetera. When she's not coaching, you can find her either lifting, kicking someone's butt in Settlers of Catan, or venturing outside on a beach or mountains with her tea and her big dog named Tabata? Tabata, yeah. Tabata. Uh, if, you're in fitness, you, you, if you're in fitness, it's kind of like a like eye roll joke. Like it's a type of, it's a style of workout essentially, so. Gotcha, and for those of, of you who can't see me, uh, I'm not. I guess is the short way to answer that. Hey, <laughs> no, have you not seen like certain Olympians? Like, what are you talking about? You don't have to necessarily look a certain way to be an athlete or do stuff. I'm already going to start coaching. Sorry. <laughs> Fair enough. We can do that too. I would be so happy to do a, uh, go through a coaching session, but, uh, instead we're going to talk about how you grow your business by changing your habits. Before we get into that with Danya, we're going to talk about our last episode that aired last week. So once you're done here, you can listen to that episode where Aaron Thomas shared with us the marketing strategies you can implement when time is scarce. So I would say in our back-to-back, -back, two of the biggest things that law firm owners struggle with is the time being scarce and then the right habits to achieve success. So this will be a good back-to-back. So let me start here with you. Uh, one, please, you got to have some crazy cool stories from the head athletic trainer, strength and conditioning coach. Um, what do you find as crazy though? So this is the fun part. It's like, I've probably asked the same question. I have no idea what your world's like too, but um, it was, it was amazing working with those athletes. Like you travel the world and you don't necessarily see where you're traveling because you just see a lot of hotel rooms and pools or gyms and stuff, right? Because I'm spending time working with athletes. But um, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of amazing moments. Nothing, honestly, that comes ugh, like top of mind. I think I will say though, like, did you guys watch the previous Olympics that just happened? Uh, somewhat. I had somewhat. no Olympic spirit. I'm really sorry. I That's wish so I could sorry. say differently. It was just like between COVID and it's everything. All good. All right. Yeah. Don't say sorry. You, you like what you like. But it was cool to see some athletes I used to work with, like be competing and stuff. So that was pretty special to see all the work they put in up until that point, especially dealing with the COVID curveball and then be able to still compete and stuff. So um, that's more in my present memory right now. But um, yeah, man, I don't have like one one thing that stands out in this very moment. Who's the most successful athlete you've worked with then? Um, so I worked with and helped with like Brian Cochran and Hillary Caldwell. So those guys were swimmers, um, both retired. Uh, worked with Eugene Lang, who was the strength and conditioning coach and therapist at the time. So we both facilitated those guys. But my the sports I worked with were Swimming Canada, um, Triathlon Canada, Rugby, mainly women's, Paratriathlon, so we got our Paratriathletes competing right now, uh, Diving, which is cool to see. Selena just competed as well at the Olympics. It, so it's funny. So in sport, you're positioned with one team, but then when you go travel, you everyone from all over the nation will come and travel with you. So, man, like Penny, I'll, I'll, I don't even say your name. Penny, your name's typical Pen. Um, Michelle, like all of the main swimmers from the previous Olympics, 
or as ones I worked with. So it's been, it's eclectic and it's been a lot of different athletes over time. So I'm not trying to be like vague in general, but imagine that you're not just with one team, you're with like all the athletes that come in at different various times in camps and stuff too, when you travel with them. So many, many fun ones. Yeah. And I've heard that may have been the weirdest part about this Olympics. Cause I was talking to one of the yeah. athletes and it was like, you used to just go and hang out. And now it's like, all right, you got to come in 40, 48 hours or 72 hours before your event. You got to be yeah. out 48 hours after your event's over. And so like, there's a lot less of an experience to it, but also a lot less of trainings. So, like one of them ended up with yeah. um, having some knee issues. Hopefully he'll be okay, but it's crazy yeah. here. Yeah. I don't honestly like, and then talk about mindset and mental game, like to be able to, because here's the thing at that level, every, most athletes have the access to like the trainers, the nutritionists, the psychologists, everything. Right. And you're, everyone's at the top of their game. And it's like, okay, well, what's really the differentiating factor between the 1%? And most times it's how you manage your thoughts, your mindset and the curveballs that come at you and with you throughout the time. So it's interesting to see all the athletes step up and handle COVID and handle like not really being in the athletes arena or just like coming in and leaving. Um, it just, it's, it's, it's so impressive because already, already what they do is like very intense, very high risk. And now you're putting on this other layer of element of mental resilience and toughness too. So but that's really a huge differentiator between anyone successful. It's like, how well can you manage the mental side of things? Yeah. And it's amazing to me because like, look, we're talking with Olympic athletes from the, the top 1% of the top 1% of the top 1%. Yeah. And then obviously when you transition over into business owners and you're dealing with the top 1% of the top 1% of the top 1% of business, you've got to see a ton of overlap in a, in a weird and interesting way. So many. And I, you know what, I, I didn't actually realize how many, but like, really to be a high performer, everyone has foundational thoughts or habits or, or processes in place, right? So like overcoming fear of failure and, and being able to handle setbacks and stuff and resiliency and commitment, dedication. So many of those things, no matter what um, arena you're in, whether it's sports or business or no matter what your niche or domain is, you have to have certain qualities and mental skills and abilities to be able to ride the highs and lows of everything. So it was, it was a very natural transition. I still do that through Pure Life, which is the fun part but primarily them working with um, entrepreneurs or high performers and pivoting. It's all mainly tackling the mindset stuff. So that's really what I find makes the true difference. Cause here's the thing. Most of us know what to do. Like, is that fair to say if we think about health or fitness or marketing or in business or, you know, whether to delegate or hire someone, most of us know a general idea of what to do, but it's in those times of what's actually preventing you from doing it. So let's say you have a step-by-step -step plan of marketing or hiring someone or, running a launch process, most times what doesn't get in people's way is actually up the, the plan itself, but the application of it. And so it's like, what's preventing you from actually applying what you know to do or following through the plan? So that's where I got really curious. So my background's mainly in like physical injuries and health and injury, injuries, sorry, I said it twice. But you start dealing with people who aren't in that space and you give them a step-by-step -step plan. And it's like, here, follow this from A to Z, right? And they still won't do it. And you're like, what is that? What's preventing you from actually just executing the plan and applying what you know? And so that's what really got me interested in the mindset piece. Cause I'm like, there's something I'm missing here that I can't quit put my finger on. And it's all the subconscious stuff, the beliefs, the invisible dragons, as I like to call them, because it's like, wait a second, like, you know, you need to do this, but then it's like this er, feeling of stopping or not actually going through and executing what you know you need to do. So yeah, it's been super like fascinating. And one of the things that you touched on in that, that I really want to highlight for everybody is you talked about, you know, solving problems and overcoming adversity. Like that is going to be a consistent thing the whole way through. Nothing that yep. we are talking about is going to make life easy. It's going to make it easier or make it easier to overcome problems. Uh, I've been reading the subtle art of not giving an F and yep. they talk about, and I love the thing. It's like, it's, it's not that you don't want to have problems to solve. It's that you want to solve the problems that you have fun solving. And I think yep. that's a huge component of uh, things that we need to make sure we explain to more and more attorneys. It will not be perfect, but we want to get you lined up in focusing on the problems that you get enjoyment out of. Yeah. And so, like what you can control, right? So, so many of us spend so much time and energy wasting on things that we have no control over, worrying about things like the past or the future or like what someone else is going to do or how someone else is going to react. It's like you only, when you realize you only have control over you and your thoughts and what you do, you spend a lot less time like wasting energy and time on stuff that you can control. So when you can really get back to the ground in place of like, what can I control? My thoughts, my intention, my actions, and the rest is going to happen how it's going to happen. 
and build that mental resiliency to handle whatever comes at you, like that, that's where the magic lies. Because especially with lawyers, like you guys are in the business of solving problems. Same with entrepreneurs. Like if you go in your day and you think you're not going to have any problems, which is funny even how we define that word, right? Like a problem is like a negative connotation, but we can redefine it as a good thing. Like, great, these are opportunities or these are things I didn't know or was aware of. Every problem has a solution. So it's so fun to kind of dive into language and how we define things and really like where we're setting ourselves up for success and what lens we're looking through can really dictate how our day goes or how we like handle any situation that's thrown at us. So yeah, I love that you dove into there. And you just set me up for my next question was always going to be, and this is so perfect. What's your definition of habits? Like, what are we talking about when we talk about habits? So oh, I love that I love you, this. you let, you led me into that with the uh, wording. So, and I would like challenge anyone on here. I want you to define what it means for you, like anything like, and this sounds like so tedious, but truly, so I'm going to take a sidebar here for a sec. What, how do you define success? Everyone else is going to define it differently than me and versus you, Jordan, right? How do you define happiness? How do you define discipline? How do you define problem? Our definitions like create our realities, right? So it's like with anything, not even just the word habit, but look at how you're defining accomplishment, success, happiness for you and ask yourself, does this work for me? Is this is my definition or is this something that someone else has or created? And I'm just taking on and like kind of going like a bag in the winds. Yeah, this is success. But really that version of success doesn't actually work for you or you even don't, you don't even want those things. So just a sidebar there, look at how you define really everything for yourself. And is it yours or is it someone else's definition? Um, but when it comes down to habits, Wait, can I jump in before you do that? Yeah, please go. So I always tell attorneys it's three questions. From, from the term of success, how much money yeah. do you want to make? How much time do you want to work? And what work do you want to be doing in that time frame? And that's what I always tell them to focus on. And I, I totally it. agree with you. The answer will be different for everybody. But I find that yeah. those three questions get you to where you need to be. Yeah, I love that. Well, and that's just the thing, right? Like, um, which is why I love the mindset piece. It's like you really get to be from this autopilot metaphorically like bag in the wind, like going through the motions and just kind of doing what you should be doing or told to do or you think is supposed to happen getting you back into the intentional driver's seat and then questioning everything. Is this my definition? Is this what I want to be doing? Is, do I actually want to be making millions of dollars or am I okay with half a million or you know a quarter million? Or like, it's really getting clear of you and what you want as a person, not just based on other people's expectations or society or what you think you should or shouldn't be doing. For example, look at your wonderful shirt. Uh -oh. Most lawyers are in suits and uh -oh. ties, right? It's like, do I need and to be miserable. wearing? Exactly. So it's like, just question stuff and ask yourself, is this mine? Is this how I define stuff? Is this making me happy? I'm in a tank top. I, I'm so happy I don't have to wear a you know professional attire because that's just not who I am. But I've created a space where I can be who I am and what I want to do, right, based on my own definition. So I love that you're wearing a Hawaiian shirt because it's like, do most lawyers wear Hawaiian shirts? Probably not, right? Not no. saying you have to, but that's obviously what you love to do and how you are comfortable. So it's like, great, you've defined that for yourself. So Okay, back to the habit. Um, the fun thing is everything is a habit. Like everything is a habit. Your thoughts are a habit. Your ways of being are a habit. What you do or don't do are habits. Everything is a habit. And so the fun thing is habits are created in the brain to keep you efficient. I want everyone to think of like through that lens. So when you do something a certain amount of times, your brain doesn't know subconsciously if it's good or bad. It just recognizes that, oh, Daniel's done this a certain amount of times, repeating it around the same time of day or whatever, right? This must be important to her for her survival. <laughs> so I'm going to make sure that I create this a habit. I'm going to take this off of her plate so she doesn't have to think about it subconscious or yeah, consciously anymore and make it into this efficient auto program habit. Okay. The reason so I'm going even this, if. So even if it's sitting on the couch for five hours a day watching Netflix, your body is still going to have that same, like, this Million is what percent. you need to survive. Yes. And this okay. is so cool. important because, because here's why. Your brain is not designed to make you happy. And some people can just, like, take that and be like, what? It's not designed to make you happy. It's designed to make you survive and keep you safe and be able to predict what's coming next based off of your past, right? So it's always pulling back from experience and it runs these programs. So the thing is, these programs are these habits. Everything's a habit, how you think, what you do, what you don't do. They're all habits, right? 
everything that it runs, it's picked up from either something you've done a number of times. It's like, oh, this is important. Or it's taken on previous programming. Like when you're a child from zero to seven, you're just a sponge. And I used to hate when people talked about child stuff, like, oh yeah, blame your parents. It's not that though. Like when you realize how the brain works and before you're seven years old, you have no critical factor. You're just taking on everything, every look, every comment from your coach, your teacher, your parents, your sibling, everything is being programmed from your childhood, right? And then it keeps being programmed as you go through life until you stop and start questioning those programs. And I'll, I'll loop this back in a sec, but it's so important to realize this because so many of us are like, oh, this is a good habit, this is a bad habit. Your brain doesn't know that. Your brain just goes, you've done this a number of times or you've picked this up a number of times. This is important for survival, even though yes, you're like consciously eating bags of chips and watching Netflix is for my survival. Consciously, you know that, but subconsciously, your body doesn't know that. Just like, this is a program, let's take it off your plate, make you more efficient and just run this in the background. For example, can you imagine if you had to like, remember how to breathe and blink and do your heart rate and, you know, like think consciously of tying your shoes or brushing your teeth. We know that those things are all very automatic and easy to do, right? Those are just habits. You've done them enough times, your brain's like, boom, great. If you had to consciously relearn how to brush your teeth every time, how much time and energy would that be wasting? A crap ton, right? So yeah. your body's brain's job is to take things off your plate so you can focus on like the 5%. So now, that's, that's so interesting because leading into this, like I always thought habits are what, you're, what you do subconsciously, but it sounds like it's that and more. Yep, totally. Okay. Yep. And where, where this is like kind of revolutionary for people or like, oh, because we're mean to each other. Like we're mean to ourselves. So let's just be honest. Everyone's mean to, like we're way hard on ourselves than we need to be. It's I don't know. Not, you're, not a, you're not an old white dude. We're pretty good on ourselves. It's true. Sorry, that was a terrible joke. No, that's fine. I just like cut you off too, sorry. <laughs> so um, we are hard on ourselves, right? We're like, we are mean to ourselves or like we're the critical of ourselves. We make ourselves feel guilty all the time. But I want to try and separate the meaning and attachment to just like think of your brain as like it's running a program. It's separate from you. And if you can disassociate from it, even better. You can be like, you can name it something different. You can name it something you, whatever, like a funny name or something you don't like to just remind yourself, this is not me. This is just my brain running its stuff. And I'll, when you say, sorry, when you say disassociate okay. yourself from it, are you talking about disassociating, disassociating yourself from your feelings, from your thoughts, from your brain, thoughts. from your thoughts? Okay. Yeah, thoughts. I know I've right. opened up like a lot of loops, but I promise they're like all going to come back. I'm opening loops on purpose, but okay. So disassociate from your thoughts, because here's the thing. We talked about this before, right, Jordan? Um, you are not your thoughts. You're the observer and thinker of your thoughts. And like, if you can just sit there and hold that one for a second, everyone, like you're not your thoughts. You're the thinker and observer of your thoughts. You have like 80,000 plus thoughts a day. Majority of them, 80 plus percent are negative and old thoughts. So hold on, I'm opening the loops, but I'll close all of them. Yeah, no, 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 go for it. When you can recognize that you're not your thoughts, you're just an observer, and every thought you have doesn't have to be true or you don't have to make it mean anything. You can just observe and like, let it go, right? That's powerful in itself. But when you realize that thoughts and you can disassociate yourself from your thoughts, almost just like it's another person, it can help take the meaning and intention or sting out of certain things of thoughts. Like you suck or you failed, or I can't believe you said this, or whatever. You can just say, cool, thanks for the thought and just let it kind of go on by as if it's like a cloud passing by. But what most people do is they think they have to believe every thought that they have and they attach meaning and attach onto every thought. And it's so powerful when you recognize you're not your thoughts, you're the observer of your thoughts. You don't have to believe every thought that you have. You can choose where you place your attention. So where this is important, I'm gonna almost close this whole loop, is thoughts, we have so many of them a day, like 80 plus thousand thoughts a day. Most of them are negative, most of them are from the past and repeating old stuff. Right? That's not very helpful in creating future stuff if we're just repeating past stuff. But subconsciously, thoughts come before our emotions. Or if you don't like that word, use state, how you feel, right? So thoughts come before emotions or, or your state, which becomes before your behavior and your actions or your habits, right? And that comes before your results. So when you can understand that's how things work, right? No matter who you are, 
you're always going to have subconscious thoughts going on. They're going to come before you how you feel. And based on how you feel your state, you're going to choose to do or not do certain things, which is going to give you results or not give you certain results. Right. But you as a conscious person, right. That's what separates us from everything is being conscious. You get to choose where you place your attention. You get to choose what you give meaning to. And that's so powerful because nothing has meaning, any meaning, except for the meaning that you give it. And why this is so important is because you think about high performers and the stress they're dealing with and everything they have to do. Like you can give a lot of meaning to a lot of thoughts, like someone gave you a bad review or a client fired you or gave you a refund or whatever. You can attach a lot of crappy meanings to that stuff, or you can just say, this is, is what it is. I'll take some critical feedback, but it doesn't actually have to mean anything about me. And I can choose to see it differently if I need to. And here's why I want to explain like the emotion and state thing. Just imagine when you are confident, you know you, what you're doing. You just gave a really powerful presentation. You feel like you're on top of the world. What kinds of actions and behaviors does someone in like a really confident state take, right? What do they do? What do they think versus someone who's like really like self-critical or just like feeling like crap? I almost swore. Can I, am I allowed to swear? Am I not allowed to swear? I, don't I mean, if you swear, we just have to list it as explicit, so. Okay, I will try not to speak. <laughs> I've done pretty good so far. Okay, so here's the thing. You think, everyone listening right now, when do you tend to make the best decisions? When you're like feeling good about yourself, you're confident, and you feel like empowered versus you feel like crap, you're tired, you're demotivated, right? We tend to make different choices based on our states. It just is a natural progression. But when you can disassociate and go to loop everything back, you're not your thoughts, you're the observer of your thoughts. Thoughts, whether you're conscious of them or not, come before how you feel. So if you're like, I wonder my, where my thoughts are, tap into how you feel, tap into your state. And you can ask yourself, where is my attention right now? And is it serving me? And is it going to help me move forward and make choices that are serving my goals and where I'm going? Or is it taking me back, like almost being like an anchor, keeping me stuck on repeat, the same things I always do every day? So the reason we want to learn a little bit about the brain and dissociating and habits, it's like having chips is just having chips. It is what it is. But it's us who attaches a meaning onto having chips. Oh, having chips is bad. Oh, having chips is good. Sitting on the couch watching Netflix. Oh, that's bad. Oh, that's good. No, no, no. It just is what it is. And we as conscious beings are attaching meanings onto everything, right? So when you can understand habits, they're keeping the brain efficient. And you can understand and you can disassociate from your thoughts and you're not all of your thoughts that you think. And you can consciously choose where to place your attention and energy. And you can choose a new thought, one that better serves you. You will likely take different actions and behaviors, which gets you different results. I so, think sorry. Nope, go. Yeah, I, I, maybe. I think I'm there with you. So here's Keep my asking. question then. Yeah, because yeah. I, I love, and we're going through this. I got a three and a half year old. So we're totally going through this from the, oh, they're not so good foods good. and bad foods. Like it's, yep. a, it's I'm, I'm feeling what you're putting out. I'm picking up what you're putting down. So from the standpoint of habits, do we have good habits and bad habits or do we just have habits that get us closer to our success or farther away from whatever our expected outcome is? Totally. I, and I'll throw it back in you. Nothing has any meaning except for the meaning you give it. So okay. if something, if for yourself, if you feel like labeling something good or bad or right or wrong is empowering for you, great. But if it's not, it makes you feel like crap then let's change the language around it because your brain subconsciously doesn't know if it's good or bad. It's just going to run the program, right? It's just there, whatever you're doing over time, it's going to say, Oh, she needs us to survive and stay safe. I'm going to take this as a habit. So if you, if you look at your behaviors and you look at your goals, are they getting you closer to your goals or are they not? And if they're not, then we need to reevaluate the habits that we're creating, recognizing that your brain's just trying to do its job. It's not, you're not a bad person if you can't follow through in your habits. And I want to, I want to say this too. So whoever is listening, when we're trying to create a new habit, remember you have all your previous years in hard running, you're going against, like, that's a lot of time and a lot of repetitions, like millions of repetitions. If you were, if I was to tell you, okay, I want you to try brushing your teeth with your non-dominant hand tomorrow. I want you to really feel how awkward that is. It's awkward. And you would say, no, because I, I brush my teeth and I have my phone in my dominant hand the whole time, right? Is that well, not there how? There you go. Then switch it. So if you're, if you're, <laughs> you're go the other way, I can't say that. It's like left handed. I am left handed. No, no, no. Then switch it so it's not in your hand that you use often, right? So whatever hand you use for brushing your teeth, most times you use your other hand. 
Nice try, Jordan. <laughs> well, I like I like the concept of um, like trying to write your name or trying to write your shopping list with your other hand. Yeah. Like that for me, I have terrible handwriting right-handed, but like left-handed, I can Can't see it. how it matches my three and a half year old in terms of yeah. the ability to form letters. So yeah. no, I, uh, I'm, I'm with you on that. Well, and it's just, it's just highlighting too. Like it, it takes time, like conscious repetition, but first you got to question stuff. Like first you need to have clarity and awareness of yourself, like how you define things. What are your goals? Clarity there. And then evaluating your thoughts and your beliefs and your behaviors. And are those serving you and getting you towards your goals or are they not? Right. So then if they're not, then, okay, what do we do? Do we, how do we set ourselves up for success to actually make these habits stick? And so then we can go and talk about like, make it obvious, make it simple, like super simple, make it fun, habit stack it with things. So habit stacking is like doing something with something else. So if you always have coffee at 6 a.m. and you want to try making a habit of journaling, you can put your journal and pen out right beside the coffee machine, make it obvious and visual, right? And say to yourself, I'm going to journal one line before my cup of coffee, right? So you can kind of, there's so many strategies around it, but regardless of the strategy, just like marketing and business, every strategy works but not if your internal programming and hardware are like not lined up, right? So if you have beliefs about yourself, like, oh, I always fail, I never stick to my habits, uh, I'm not healthy and you're trying to be healthy, or I'm not successful and you're trying to be successful, like whatever our, our identity and beliefs are underneath everything, our filters, no matter how much conscious effort we put out there, you're never going to make that connection. And so that's when we kind of start talking about subconscious reprogramming and really understanding how do I change at the identity level at my belief level to help make it sure that I'm lined up with where I'm actually wanting to go. So is all of this really working backwards? Like it sounds like we've got to identify what our end goal is and yep. then we can look at do our current habits get us closer or farther from that. And then we can back it up to, you know, what power am I giving into the, what, well, I guess what state of being am I put in? during this yep. based upon my thoughts is that am i right in that backward step yeah pretty close and i would say so before let's back up even more so get clarity on your goal and where you want to go in life right always work from like because if we don't have this is the metaphor i like to use if we don't have a destination i'm sure everyone has used some form of like google maps if we don't have any destination we might know where we're starting from but if we don't have an address to put in no blue lines pop up for us right it's just like we can go anywhere we can do anything right and your subconscious brain needs specific clarity of where it's going. So it's the more specific you can get, the more helpful you're going to be for your subconscious brain. And your brain is crazy and cool. It will start looking for those examples and finding evidence to match where you're putting your attention, right? So if anyone's bought like their car or a dog, if people don't drive, when you bought that car, did you now notice that that car suddenly was everywhere? Yes, all did. the time, every time. Now, was it more? Was it because there was more cars? Everyone decided to buy the same car, and there's a big sale, or was it your brain and your particular activating system trying to now? Oh, Danny's now bought this car. This is important, so I'm going to point out every car that's the same as hers. It wasn't that more cars and everyone just bought that car. It was your brain. You put that attention and specific focus on your brain, and now it's going to go find evidence. I so thought it was such an influencer that because I got a gray infinity, everybody so else got one too. Everyone's like, Jordan, I need that shirt. I need a, I need that Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. But it's your brain. So you you can when you learn about your brain and how it works, you can use your brain as a weapon and for your advantage. But what's happening is most people are just like aren't aware of it. It's not your fault. But it's just kind of going through the motions and you're frustrated and you're stuck. Like, I want to be here consciously and I'm efforting and putting all this like conscious effort in. But if you're not aligning your, your beliefs, your identity, your habits towards that, you're never going to get there. But when you can learn that, you can actually use your brain to your advantage, understand a little bit how it works, how to identify your own beliefs or your habits, right? And then start reprogramming them. Bob's your uncle. I don't know who came up with that saying. Like, why is that a saying? Bob's your uncle. Somebody who had Bob as an uncle. I don't have an uncle named Bob, though. Like, I'm like, what is that saying? Anyways, yeah. Did. Well, so that's the... Uh... Back to your thing real quick. So yeah. what I would do is I want you to, whatever your goal is, I want you to ask questions like, what do I believe to be true about myself and this goal? So let's say it's about business. Business stays open when you make money. Okay, so I want you to ask yourself your beliefs about money. Is, what did you hear growing up as a kid? Money's hard to come by. Money's evil. Money's greedy. Money's this. Like whatever your stories and beliefs are about money. Because it's super important to identify what your subconscious beliefs are about money 
Because if you don't learn to change and shift those to better serving beliefs of someone who is successful and has lots of money, you're never going to be able to consciously effort your way there, right? You're always going to end up self-sabotaging in some capacity, not on purpose, but you're always going to come back to your own belief level, your own kind of thermostat of where you're currently at. And if we want to jump levels in business or health, we need to really evaluate what are my current beliefs about people, money, health, the world. And are those beliefs helping me get me towards my goal or are they keeping me stuck and preventing me from moving forward? And then so go back to the identity level. Does that part, okay, so like the one I get all the time, I yep. want my firm to make a million dollars a year. And then Amazing. every follow-up question doesn't have the, like why, I don't know, because it sounds good, whatever, whatever the yeah. answer is. But like from that standpoint, do we need to evaluate the habits first or do we skip over that? No. So skip over that, go to the beliefs and then come identity. back to re an identity, then come back to recreating the habits that we can use to get the outcome of making that random number pulled out of the air. Yeah. I'm so happy you brought this up. So most people, and I'll use a gym analogy. So most people try and create change from like the doing part, habits, setting up routines, right? The doing. You think about um, New Year's Eve gyms. The first three weeks, everything's packed. Everyone's like, New Year's resolutions, I'm going to get healthier. And they buy the shoes and they buy the gym pass and they go there. And then what happens in three weeks time? They're back to their old habits, right? So most of us try and change at the environment or doing behavior level. When true change actually comes from your beliefs and your identity. So we, we need to look at the identity characteristics and qualities and values of someone who's already achieved that level of success in business, in health, whatever it is, relationships, doesn't matter. So what we wanna do is, what is my goal? Get clarity there first. Then we need to ask ourselves, who is the version of someone who's already achieved that? What are their beliefs about money, success, business, people, right? What are their values? What are their ways of being? What is their identity? Like, what are their I am statements? So do they say like, I'm not very confident or are they like, I'm successful, I'm confident, I'm whatever, right? So we want to look at a deeper level of the identity of someone who's already achieved that version of success. Then what we want to do is based on the identity level, look at ourselves. Like, where are we at? Do we believe these things to be true about money, about business, about people, whatever? And if we don't, we need to start rewriting those stories of our identity and our beliefs first. And then the rest just happens, right? Because someone who values money, someone who values health, will automatically have various habits and behaviors attaining to that. So I want you to think about, it's almost like a domino effect. If we can hit the main domino and make everything change down, amazing. But what most people do is they try and just change at the action level and they're missing like two or three levels above it and they don't actually get that true change long-term over time. Wait, so are you saying... I should draw this out. Are you saying that the, the changing identity, changing mental state part of it allows you to keep make the habits stick or it allows you to yep. see what the habits need to be or it allows you both. to all oh, both okay both of them for sure and it, it's just like that domino effect so what is the what is the when we create change at the identity level that is the ticking domino that goes all the way creates all the change from levels of change so it goes identity beliefs characteristics behavior which is like habits environment and then your end results right so if we can create change at the identity level, right, that causes a natural domino effect onto everything. You're naturally going to want to do or have certain behaviors and beliefs because you've changed like, I am a healthy person. And you start asking yourself questions. Does a healthy person choose this or choose this? Like it's just, it becomes this natural way of thinking and being when you change at the identity level. Yes, it takes like conscious effort and um, intention, but you're very crystal clear on who is the version of someone who's already achieved that level of success. And operating from that, you ask yourself questions like, okay, my identity level, what is someone who has made $5 million, what, how would they handle this problem? How would they choose how to deal with this person or the situation versus being in my current state of like, oh, shoot, freak out, overwhelm, right? You get to start changing. This is a big part of NLP is modeling success is operating from the version who's already achieved that goal from the version who's already had that success thinking like they think, and it eventually becomes who you are naturally. But if we stay in this same conscious state of like what your current thoughts and beliefs are, you're never going to make that actual long-term change. Did that help clarify? I think so. I, I my, you've blown my mind like 14 times on this. I'm so sorry. like, I'm trying to put it back together. <laughs> I'm, trying to, 
Reese is going to have to come scrape it off the wall and put it back in when we're done here. <laughs> um, so, so you're not really, let me phrase this the right way. You mm -hmm. aren't necessarily finding these people that have been through what you want to go through from the standpoint of emulating them. You're doing it from the standpoint of thinking the same things as them from having the same mental state Thought as them. Purposes. Yeah. In a way, yeah. So let's say, for example, like I haven't achieved $5 million, right? So for me, if that's really hard to imagine that that's too big of a gap and I can't see clearly and I can't answer the questions, I would then look to other people who emulate those certain qualities and embody, embody those characteristics. So I could look at like you or James Wedmore, someone else who I know who's achieved that level of success or that goal I want to go after, right? And I can be like, what would they think? What are their thoughts? How do they show up? And I can start pulling from to get clarity for my brain, right? Because your brain wants specificity and clarity. I can start pulling from other examples and to see oh yeah, do they, would they think this way or they, would they do this or would they probably move somewhere else and do something different? It's just to start shifting your perspective because remember back to our first comment, like you have 80,000 plus thoughts a day. Most of them are on repeat from before. Most of them are negative. So guess what? If we allow that to keep going, you're just going to keep recreating the exact same future, maybe getting a little bit better over time, but we need to really take hold of where are we putting our attention what are the filters that we're actually projecting out like our own beliefs and identity to create conscious change and get back into the driver's seat of when I have this problem or scenario, how would $1 million version of me handle it? What would she do? Would she delegate? Would she cower? Would she show up with confidence? Would she whatever? Or would I act like myself and like, oh, I'm just going to pretend it's not there. So it helps shift you to get into perspective of already achieving that goal. If you haven't achieved that goal, look to someone else who has and ask them questions like, how are your thoughts? Or what qualities they have that you can take on and embody and just start, whether it's an alter ego you create, whether it's you name it, like Beyonce had Sasha Fierce for the longest time. If you knew that when she stepped on stage, I, she I stepped into amazing. <laughs> but when she stepped on stage, she went from Beyonce to Sasha Fierce and Sasha Fierce showed up a certain way. She like, re, like entertained a certain way. Like she was a new person. And eventually those two identities merged but she had to step into a different version of herself looking from a different perspective. So whether you need to create an alter ego or whether you can just say, this is who I am and you can create like a cue or whatever it might be, it's super important to put yourself into the identity of who you want to be and how you want to think, not where you currently are at. So along, so, okay. I'm the law firm owner and I want to mm -hmm. make a million dollars a year. Mm -hmm. Am I better off emulating Jeff Bezos, who's not a law firm owner, but has made, I think I read something, if he spent a million dollars a day, he'd be 300 before he got through it versus, um, versus like the law firm owner down the street who's at like 1.1 million. Or do I need both of those things? I would say like whatever is going to inspire you and give you clarity. It goes back to definitions. There's no right or wrong. Okay. It's whatever you're going to resonate with. So the fun thing is when it comes to like money beliefs, a lot of people have like really like stringent money beliefs, right? But it's like, okay, let's say Jeff Bezos, of course, he's got billions upon billions of dollars. Um, but when we look at that, there's so such a variety of ways people make money, ways people spend money, different value. Like there's so much variety out there. So if you need to find something that you feel aligns with yourself, right? but making sure that you're actually stepping into where you want to go. So you get clarity on the goal and who you want to be and what you want to work towards. That's great. You give yourself direction. And then what are the characteristics, the beliefs, the values, the identity of someone who's already achieved that goal? If you don't have it in yourself, look for someone who inspires you, right? Look for someone who you can learn from or look up to. And it can be a combination of people. Like it doesn't have to be one person, but those people who have achieved that goal, the good thing about NLP is it's just modeling success. If one person's done it, that means you can do it. However, right. get clear on what your version of success and your definitions are for yourself. Because it's so easy just to chase the money goals, chase the cars, chase this. But if you're not happy and you're not actually fulfilled, then it's like, okay, cool. You're going to get the goal, but then not be happy or fulfilled in that process. So get clear on who you are and what you want, where you're going, and pick on like multiple people's examples that inspire you to actually want to be there. So that in those moments of... of Choosing old way, which is going to always want to be happening versus choosing new way. The more you can choose the new way of thinking, the new way of habits, beliefs, identity, the more likely you're going to get towards your goal. It's so interesting. Like, we always, we always come back to the same stuff 
for on so many of these conversations. And really, I mean, I think the biggest takeaway is finding what finding what works best for you mm -hmm. through the standpoint of who you want to emulate, who's gotten to where you want to be. Yeah. Get clear on on your definition of success, your definition of happiness, your definition of inner peace, your definition of whatever it is, right? And it just goes back to like you, whether people want to believe it or not, you can be, do, and have anything you want in life. You can, you truly can, but not with your old way of thinking. And James always says, it's what got you here won't get you there. Yeah. So you need to get evaluating like, okay, is my current way of thinking and my beliefs and identity, is this getting me to where I want to go? And do I actually want to go there? Like, why am I chasing $10 million? Do I actually need 10? It's not saying that goals and dreams aren't a good thing. Have them, but understand your intention behind them. Is this yours or is this someone else's facade of like, great, because everyone's version of success is not right or wrong, but it's make, make sure it's your version and get clear well, on you and what you want. And that's the, and that's the biggest thing for me is <laughs> I am a habits over goals person because what ends up happening is people hit that goal and then they stop doing the habits that got them to the goal or those habits don't get them farther than the goal. Well, and this is a fun thing, Jordan, like goals are important to give you some sense of direction, but it's more about how you become along the way of that journey versus the actual goal, right? Because as you're going on that journey, your goal might change, but it's the person of who you become along that journey towards that goal, whether you hit the goal or not. Like, as business owners, we should be hitting and setting a really audacious goals that maybe we never hit, but who we become in that process of that journey is more important. Like the, the thoughts you take on the habits, the, um, the behaviors, the outreaching, the delegating, all those things need to happen and won't happen unless you have some sort of big audacious goal you're working towards, right? So yes, everything is a habit. It's just most of us right now have very autopilot habits that are unintentional right and it's like let's get us back into being super intentional of like what are we thinking about or when you feel like crap let's shift it okay what am i thinking right now or what could be the thought that came before this feeling and most oftentimes it's like doubt fear worry overwhelm anxiety whatever right and we when we can get like mastering ourselves and where we place our attention always looking at where we're wanting to go not repeating the past then with time you will get there so uh, Chelsea Williams says she loves you and oh, that hey. she, hey, that it's so, she agrees. It's so much more about the journey than the destination. So, and well, that's the, like, oh. sorry, go. <laughs> no, I just, oh, now there's a longer comment. No, I just, this is my favorite part about a live show. So um, Ch Chelsea says, especially as an entrepreneur, we have people watching us and depending upon us when SHIT hits the fan, we default to habits. So which habit will that be? Yeah, and that's it. like such a good one, Chelsea. You always default to your old ways of being, especially in times of stress and chaos and crap. So you really know when you've mastered habits, when it's like you're really tired and maybe your kid's been up all night, but you're, but you're committed to like, let's say, waking up early and journaling five minutes and moving your body or something. When crap hits the fan, you're always going to go back to your old ways of being. So to know that a habit's actually taken on is when you do it in spite of past circumstances, right? You're still stepping into the identity of yourself because you have chosen, I'm committed, I'm healthy, I keep my word, I'm integral. And you're always stepping into the identity, especially when crap hits a fan. So I love that she brought that up. Because when if you're like, I don't know if this habit stuck. Well, what happens when you're in time of stress or overwhelm or you're really freaking tired? Do you resort back to your old ways or have you stepped into this new identity of yourself? It's funny, I've, I've uh, been able to talk to a number of either July 2021 bar takers or will be February 2022 bar takers. And I was yeah. like, look guys, if you can get through COVID, who cares what happens <laughs> after that? Like it can't yeah. get worse between, yeah. you know, hundreds of thousands of people dead between locking down different States, between the courthouses being closed, between all that stuff. Like if you can get through this, you're going to, you're going to look at yourself in, I don't know. I thought we were close to the end and I hope we, I hope we are, but you're going to come out of this and be like, man, I am a much more well-adjusted in person or ready for, you know, the next problem. And then like, hopefully there won't be a problem. Totally. I would like, I would deem that um, the most successful people are those that have the most emotional resiliency. Like, how do you handle when crap hits a fan? How do you handle when like 
this happened. So for a lot of people, COVID, yes, it's horrible, but a lot of people are like, made a decision. Do I just like oh, F it and like give up and just like, or a lot of people pivoted. A lot of people got resourceful and tried new ways of thinking, new business, like they adapted to it and they didn't allow the external circumstances to dictate how they felt and where they were going. They weren't able to get resourceful and like get creative. So yeah, the one, the person who has the most emotional resiliency will always win in any situation. And hopefully you will not have another situation that is like 17 months of <laughs> no lagging through. But you know you can handle it because you did, right? It's like reminding yourself like you can handle anything that comes at you as long as you like stay in the present moment or just focusing on what you can control, which is you, not anything else. Like we couldn't control whether gyms or businesses were closed or not, like, but we had to focus on what we could control, which is our thoughts, where we place our attention. What can we do today that's going to move us forward in some capacity? Okay, that door was closed. That door was closed. Okay, let's. is there another door? Is there a window? Like, you know, it's always just thinking about being in the present moment, wherever you place your attention. That's where you create from, not the past, not worrying about the future. It's like right here, right now. And look, we could easily have this conversation for, I don't like know. 10 hours. I, that's what I was going to say, <laughs> but like I think even that like... might be underselling it. Um, but as we get towards the end, is there anything else you need to make sure that we cover? Anything that we we want to sum up before we get to our final takeaway? Before our final takeaway? Or like, is this the final takeaway? No, we still, we're still going to have our final takeaway. Okay. We're not, we're I would not just say, there yet. I would say like, look, um, no matter what the circumstances that we're in, like age, ability, knowledge, resources, whatever it is, um, you can truly be doing have anything you want in life. Like, and if there's one person out there who's done it, you can do it too. Because success is not some unique magical thing. It's a strategy and you can, or, or it's a, what do I want to say? It's success is like a blueprint. There's many versions of blueprints out there. So just find the one that works for you and get clear on who you are and realize you can you can get there. However, not with your old way of thinking or being. So it's like, get clear on what you do wanna have, define those things for yourself. And then ask yourself, who is the version of me who has achieved this goal? How do they think? How do they act? What are their behaviors? What's their identity? And is that me now? And if not, how can I choose today, or every day to choose one thing to get me closer to that identity? Like what Beyonce did with Sasha Fierce. Right. So I don't know. Now there's like another takeaway. I have well, so we'll many have, takeaways. We will have our, our final takeaway. So before we go into that, um, Chelsea also commented, I guess the two of you on her podcast talked about the benefit of working with high achievers, how all of us, you know, law firm owner entrepreneurs are already in the top 1% and how much easier it is to go from the top 1% to the top 1% of the top 1%, whatever it is along those lines. So Chelsea, if you will, please, 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 can you drop a link? to that podcast in here. So we'll have it in the comments for anybody else who goes through this. I'd love for them to have the opportunity to hear that part and get a little bit more positivity out of all of our chats. Uh, that being said, our next episode is going to air on Thursday at 1.30. Rachel Permuth and Vipul Kello will be on. We're gonna be talking about the medical and legal challenges in the COVID age. So this is gonna be really interesting about going into the impact it's had but also the how do you prove it for cases? How do you use it to your, I don't want to say advantage. How do you how do you help carry the proper reality that we have lived in under the last 17 months from a legal standpoint and from a medical standpoint? So this will be a super interesting conversation taking place Thursday at 1.30. Thank you so much, Chelsea, for dropping that link to the podcast. So that will be here if you want to listen to Danya and Chelsea talk about the upside of being a high achiever and how far and how much easier it is to be an extra, extra, extra high achiever than it is just getting to being that high achieving entrepreneur that we already all are. So that being said, now we've got the final takeaway. So if somebody has been listening for 50 minutes or so, and they remember absolutely nothing you said, it can be something you've shared, it can be something totally different, but what is that biggest piece of advice to give to our listeners, to give to our watchers when it comes to how they can be the exhibit A of a successful attorney. With one caveat, I'm going to stop you from this one. It can't be, you have to define your own success. We've talked about that one. So I want like yep. a specific actionable tip, takeaway, yada, yada, yada. Okay. Real quick. Remember your brain's designed to help you survive and keep you safe, not make you happy. Two, as a lawyer, challenge your thoughts, challenge the crap out of your thoughts. You don't have to believe every thought you had. Three, if you have your goal and you're clear on your version of success, 
ask yourself, what is the identity of that person who's already achieved that success? What are my thoughts? What are the beliefs of someone who's already achieved that goal and success? And then operate from that place every day. And any time of like conflict or stress or whether you have a choice, good or bad, whatever, step into and ask yourself, what would the version of myself who's already achieved this success do? Operate from there and watch how everything unfolds. And lawyers, at least for number one and number two, what did law school teach us? It taught us how to think critically. So that's mm. probably why we're miserable, but it makes it so much easier to think critically about our thoughts. We were taught to do it. So this should be a uh, second nature, positively or negatively for you. And obviously it'll be up to you to make it into a positive thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. That was awesome. So fun. Thanks. I feel like we kind of went on lots of random tangents, but I know that kind of happens when we just start talking. So um, if anyone has questions though, let me know, drop them in the comments or reach out. But um, yeah, thanks for having me. It's, I love talking about this stuff. And we've got, um, and we've got your, do, 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 do. we've got your Facebook therapist, uh, facebook.com slash therapist fusion. We've mm -hmm. got your LinkedIn. We've got your Instagram at coach Danya. Mm -hmm. and uh, breezy make sure you get the website in there i know it was the it's the temporary website yeah. but make sure we drop that so honey, people have that so they can sign in honey domain. all right have a great day thanks jordan you too thanks team thank you for listening to an episode of exhibit a attorneys if you're interested in becoming the exhibit a of successful attorney please check us out at legalesemarketing.com e-a-s-e -E.